Uh, thank you very much and good evening everyone. Uh, first of all, let me tell you that I've got no formal beekeeping qualifications and I don't claim to be any sort of expert in beekeeping. However, I've kept bees and produced average crops of honey for over 50 years in a very marginal wet West Wales area during a period when the local sheep and dairy agriculture industries have become highly intensified and in some cases changed their whole recognition. Places that were once rich, rich land in nectar producing meadow flowers such as wild clover for, for capturing nitrogen and so on have now become, in some cases, have become floral deserts. The fields have got bigger, the hedges have been knocked down. And during this time also, varroa and all its associated viruses and problems, many of which we know little about, have appeared and had to be dealt with. And to put the icing on an already very bitter kick, we have ever increasing bee imports of totally unsuited genetic material for this area. Uh, we've got to deal with them year on year. So this talk is titled Keep It Simple and it's a description of how I have managed and adapted my beekeeping to maximize my honey production per hour of labor of input and a pound spent on sugar feed etc etc. It's worked for me for many years, it's worked for me in this area Others might disagree with my ideas and my methods, but that's up to them. All I can tell you is about how it works for me. Um, okay. So my background then, like many beekeepers, I started with a swarm. I suppose I was about the age of 14. Uh, I was fortunate in that I knew something about them, having been used, having been used by my father from about the age of 10 as slave labor. But my father was a much better beekeeper than I am. And uh, uh, so there we are. And I learned a lot from him and I also learned from the bees. The bees are the best schoolmasters you can have. Um, I spent most of my professional life as a marine electronics engineer, working on the applications engineering sort of stuff, uh, installation and project management, as well as product support of naval and other harbor radar and navigational systems. And that's been pretty much uh, at least more than over the over the majority of the worldwide. Uh, therefore, for me, nine day inspections and pulling every frame out of every hive has been out of the question. So, so I now run about I don't know I can't remember how many colonies, but say fifty colonies, and I got several sites around the countryside here. And maximum, I got a maximum of probably eight or ten colonies per per apiary. When I started beekeeping, you could put 20 colonies in one site. There was plenty of forage for them. But due to the depletion of forage, um, since I started, now eight is probably any more than eight, or certainly any more than, than 10, and you, you're pushing your luck, they, they, they're gonna be sharing the, sharing the, uh, the forage. Right, a little bit about cardigan, shall um, It's a rural agricultural area. It's good for growing grass, um, no arable farming here. It's all sheep and cows, all sheep and, and dairy. Uh, and when I started beekeeping in the 1960s, most of the inhabitants were employ in employment connected with the land in some form. Uh, and most of those households, they kept their garden, they kept a pig and maybe a few chickens and a couple of beehives on top the, on, at the top end of the garden. And the typical local bee of the time would swarm about one year in three. They were dark, docile bees. Uh, and often, if you caught the swarm and, um, and, and hived it, that swarm would collect enough food for its winter, plus there might be some surplus. So the standard of bee management tended to be quite low. Uh, the beekeepers or the cottagers would put supers on uh, as they were filled, start off, starting off back end of April. And they take them off end of July, August time, and uh, they caught any swarms and, and, and hive them. Um, so the bees allow swarming dark and docile. And, you know, things like hiving swarms, you didn't need a veil or a smoker. Uh, during the early 1960s, several large commercial operations moved into this area and they brought their own. Um, uh, foreign bees or, or, or alien bees to the area with them, more prolific yellow bees, um, which was fine, but 
since the area is marginal at best, these, uh, these commercial operations were a failure and it didn't last very long, or they diversified into something else. Now, uh, of course, by the mid-60s, these, uh, these imported bees were mixing with the local bees, and the F2 viciousness had to be seen to be believed. The viciousness was often on a scale, they'd it, it kill chickens, for example, as one of the things, that, and chase dogs and, and chase people up the road. And the viciousness was often on a scale that would shame African bees, I think. It, it's, it, they would follow you 100 yards back to the house and bombard the windows after you went in and shut the door. Um, unbelievable. Um, and bear in mind, all this was pre-BJ Sheriff's suits and uh, and uh, kit that allows sort of adverse serial beekeeping today but people cope to them uh, beekeepers cope with them various techniques were adopted with varying successes uh, and for example what you do with a vicious colony you, you would smoke it open it put the supers on the stand and then take the brood box up the far end of the apiary somewhere um, when the when the defensive bees would all fly back to the to the original site and then you give you just with the young bees so that you could carry out whatever operations you wanted to do. Um, but during that time we all acquired bigger American style smokers and became skilled in their use. If you didn't become skilled in the use of a smoker and, and being able to handle those bees, you needed to be very tough. Um, So uh, during the 1970s and this area, this agricultural area, the dairy farming was slowly becoming more intensified and more mechanized, uh, and more mechanized with bigger, on a bigger scale, fewer people were working on the land, there's more mechanization, bigger tractors, villages were gradually becoming depopulated, shops are closing down and fewer people are employed on the land. Uh, so the people no longer kept a pig in the garden, the, the villages became more commuter villages and the bees were got rid of because they sting everybody. Um, about that time, my father met and got involved with Beowulf Cooper and the Village Bee Breeders Association, and which later on became Biba. Uh, Albert Knight um, got relatives in Lampeter and he became friendly with my father. And a local bee breeding group was formed in Lampita, and local dark productive queens were produced in numbers up until the early 1980s. Right, however, there was a further, there was a further influx of commercial interest plus the associated surge of bee imports into the area in the 1990s, and this is still ongoing. Uh, this is not a problem confined to this area. I know a third generation commercial beekeeper in Normandy, in France, which is a better area for bees than here, but they, it's still agriculturally, it is still dairy, a dairy area where the milk is produced for and sent into Paris on every day. And uh, this guy is third generation, as I say, he's got local dark bees that he inherited from his grandfather. And now he faces exactly the same issues as we do here. The answer is to keep a mercenary eyes and closely monitor and manage Varroa, keep that at a low level. Uh, as well as breeding queens on the best stocks year on year and replacing the rubbish. Um, right. Where are we here? So as a result, today's beekeeper must be much more skilled. Um, you can't just be a keeper of bees now, you've got to be a beekeeper and, and, and learn to manage the varroa and, and, and raise your own bees from your own stock uh, in order to be successful. Um, and you know, whereas when I started beekeeping, the average cottager, as long as he knew when to put his supers on and take them off again and catch a swarm, he could get by. You can no longer do that. Um, and here we are. This, this is mid 1984, I think. Um, my father wrote this little booklet uh, on, on raising queens. Um, things have changed since then. We've, since then, we've had a Chinese grafting tool and we've had plastic uh, queen cell cups and stuff. We don't have to make his own anymore. But uh, the basic principles in there are still sound. And I think that, that little booklet is still available here and there. Um, so as far as protection goes then, by the 1970s, most people had got some kind of um, sheriff smock 
And there's my father there in his. Uh, he required an, a sheriff top, but that's as far as he went with him. He never owned a pair of gloves, a pair of Wellingtons or a bee suit. And yet he managed to cope with all his horrible bees and he received few stings, even from the most horrible, nasty bees. He was highly skilled in the use of a smoker and that's an art in itself, something that isn't sort of uh, popular anymore. But there's an art in using a smoker when you can keep the bees just off the edge. So you can control bad tempered bees without excessive stinging and also without unduly stressing the bees. Anybody can gas them. Uh, so six, seven. So uh, that's a photograph that explains itself. It was taken about 1975, I think it speaks for itself, as Beowulf, Beowulf Cooper and my father outside my father's house. Uh, what was our house at one time? Uh, now then, every serious beekeeper should have this book on their shelf and refer to it regularly. It contains a lot of wisdom and it contains a few things in there that you don't see anywhere else. There's much wisdom in there not found elsewhere. I think I'd recommend that book. It should be on everybody's shelf. Right, success criterion for beekeeping then. To, to be successful, the bees should produce enough honey to keep themselves, go some way to, uh, towards keeping their owner. And typically you should look for about 50 pounds of surplus honey per colony per year, year in, year out on average. You know, some years you get more, some years you get less, but that's what you need to sort of break even, I, I feel. Um, bee farmers all often complain to me that they earn, would earn more money per hour stacking shelves in Tesco's, yet they focus almost totally on the amount of honey per hive roof, how much honey they can get out of the colony, regardless of how much sugar they put in or how much, uh, how much work they do catching queen cells or swarms or whatever, swarm control. Um, so the success criteria and the weight of honey produced per man hour of labor input, that's in Cooper's book, I think, page 83, isn't it? rather than the weight of honey per hive roof, right? regardless of how much sugar is fed, and time spent on nine day inspections frame by frame. Well, that all takes time, and time is money. So in short, it's better to have bees that produce some honey every year, 80 pounds in a good year and never need feeding, is better than bees that produce 100 pounds in a good year and starve the rest of the time and have to be fed summer and winter. So, so I, we often receive starvation warnings, uh, warnings in, the, in the summer from the bee unit in York, usually midsummer, that bees, you get a fortnight of rain and we get a warning that the bees are starving. Yet when I check my hives, they're all solid. So it makes me wonder what type of bees they have in York. Maybe they're pet bees. At least feeding summer or winter. Right, so the management, my management style then. We usually get a fine week towards. We usually get a fine week towards the back end of March or the first week in April, and this is the time I make a thorough inspection of all my colonies. I clip and mark all queens. I don't always manage to get it, get them all, but uh, I make sure that all the colonies are healthy and in clean, dry hives with plenty of stores. Um, give the queen plenty of room. We're towards the end of of of, of April time. Right, you make sure that you keep ahead of the bees. When giving room, it is essential to give room for the bees, not just enough room for ripened honey to be stored, they need working space. And another thing to remember, right, not just storage room, right? Another thing to remember, for instant congestion relief, the bees are crowded and you want to relieve them, they give them drawn comb. Don't just give them foundation because for bees see foundation as just more empty space. Um, drawn comb every time or a mixture if you haven't got enough drawn comb. So in short then, when you're adding supers, when the bees are building up, uh, April, May, give them an extra, give an extra super. If you think you need a super, put two on. To give an extra super for the bees, it is important to keep ahead of the bees until the end of June in this area. The other areas might be different. Uh, we'll discuss plan B later on in another slide. So bees don't read books, they'll often surprise you. That's, they still surprise me after all these years. Um, uh, 
last week's seminar, I think, covered much of the stuff about uh, stuff that is not in books or stuff that is in books that's wrong. But uh, many modern books are copied and pasted from other books, uh, maybe copied and pasted from articles, sometimes a little bit dubious. There are books, many books written over 100 years ago, and they're available now on the cheap. I see vintage books on disc, you know, beekeeping, Google that, and for, I think for six pounds or something, you can buy a lot of books all on uh, digital format and browse through them over the winter. There's a lot of stuff in there that's been forgotten, but it's still, the bees haven't forgotten it. It's still, it's still uh, relevant today. Uh, where are we now? Right. Beekeeping skill is about experience gained over the years of rummaging about in hives. Making mistakes and getting stung. Don't micromanage the bees. You won't grow prized tomatoes or potatoes or onions or anything else if you keep digging them up and counting the roots. So beekeeping skill, as I say, is about experience gained over the years. It's a bit like riding a bike. At first you fall off often, and with the bees you get stung often. But with practice you get stung less and fall off your bike less often, and you, that's the way to learn. That's, that's, uh, bees are the best teachers. There we are. There's no substitute for experience gained over the years. I was told that when I was young, and I think it's very true. Right, you won't get the maximum surplus of honey from bees if you pull out and inspect every frame from every hive every week, as suggested in some books. If you don't, you will lose the occasional swarm. Bees will supersede and they might swarm on the supersedure cells or there might be a cell that you missed somewhere or, or, or something like that, but you will lose the occasional swarm, but it's not the end of the world. I inspect my colonies every fortnight or less often. It depends. Sometimes things go wrong. Um, Nine day inspection should not be necessary with the right bees and the right management style. So every time hives are open and frames are pulled out, the bees are stressed to a lesser or greater degree. That is, that is really true. So each inspection should take less than 10 minutes. Uh, I typically, unless there's a lot, of, a lot of hiccups, I can go through an apiary in about an hour with, with eight colonies in it. Uh, and do what's necessary. Look at four or five brood frames. You no, know, you don't see any cell eggs seen, and they got enough room. Put a super on or whatever, and and put it all back together. Give room supers as necessary. The trick is to keep ahead of the bees. You can achieve swarm control with minimum disturbance and stress to the bees. Remove the odd brood frame and replace with foundation in over strong colonies. You can harvest that uh, frame of, uh, of brood and use it for something else, like queen rearing or something. Um, do this during the June gap. And the next time you look in there, if it is drawn and has eggs in it, or brood, young brood in it during the next inspection, all is well. But if it is undrawn, beware, there will be cells somewhere. So you need to look further at that colony. In my area, June gap is a time to watch. That's also the end of May, the first fortnight in June, when traditionally the white clover came on flows or the middle of June to the end of July. But we, that's not such a huge crop anymore. But it's still, it's still there. Right, so when you go through colonies, the more smoke that is used and the more frames that is pulled, the greater the stress on the bees. Best inspections are quick, calm and quiet. This, this inspection should be over before the bees realize what's happening and that you've been there and before they have become disturbed enough to the point of having their hackles raised. The, uh, bees react at about five different levels. Uh, at level one, uh, they don't even know that you're there and level five is they, they go for you. Now then the bees. The best bees for cardigan show were here in the 1950s. The best bees for each area are already there before man started meddling with them and moving them genetic material about. And that's been proven scientifically in recent years by the Europeans uh, and by research institutes all over. 
So I don't know why we keep on shipping bees around the world, but there we are. Uh, beekeepers that have kept bees for a long time have witnessed waves of imports from well, both from well-meaning amateurs trying to save the planet and those with commercial interest in importing and selling cheap imported queens from strains totally unsuited to the Welsh environment we got here, to the harsh environment. So the best bees for the area are already here. It's just that many of the better quality is often masked by the genes of alien stock. And part of my annual bee management agenda these days is to raise queens from the best 10% of my stock and replace the worst year on year. So no longer is it, is it good enough just to be a beekeeper and plonk supers on and take them off again. You now got to monitor the row with a mercenary eye and other bee diseases and the successful beekeeper now must also be a skilled breeder and bee improver to be successful. Well, they're not difficult, but uh, yeah, you, you, you need to be aware and it has to be done. This is a normal distribution curve for those that have done A-level maths. Uh, basically, what does it tell us? Well, it can be applied. This normal distribution curve is applied to all sorts of stuff, like the safety cases of grinding wheels and radar detection of stealth of stealth aircraft. Uh, put simply, any characteristic, whether it's the IQ of the general public or the quality of bees, six will be average out of 10, and two will be total rubbish, or two will be a bit rubbish, two will be very good, one of the 10 will be really, really useless, and one of the 10 will be really, really good. So that's all that normal distribution really tells us. So, just to explain that again, I spoke to Roger, and Roger thinks there are 12 colonies. No, Roger, there's only 10. Six average, two above and two below. One of the two above average will be really good, much more productive, tougher and calmer. Graft on this one, and one will be really, at the other end of the spectrum, one will be really useless and will probably die out the next winter anyway, so split it up and make nukes with it. So B improvement then. If we take a set of graphs from our best 10% or the best hive in our 10 and use the queens produced to requeen the worst, oh, excuse me, then within a couple of seasons, all the bees will be above average. On the other hand, if you never select and never raise your own queens, we're going to be committed to only ever having average bees. Somebody, somebody told me, a beekeeper told me once, that his best colonies were all swarms that he'd, that he'd caught about the place. Well, in that case, they're all average. So if you take 10 swarms, one will be really good, one will be totally rubbish, and six will be average. So you're, you're, unless you raise queens from your best year on year, unfortunately, these days, you're, you're, you're limiting yourself. So while the local average bee was acceptable 60 years ago, with the ever-increasing levels of imports diluting the stock, diluting the quality, then this is no longer the case. And two points to emphasize on this slide, this slide, that you will never buy better queens than those you raise yourself from your own stock or your neighbor's stock and raise quality queens, raise them in their ideal conditions. I will get to that later on. And I, I listened to a lecture once by a guy called Mike Palmer from America, and I think he was quoting somebody else. And this, this worth, is worth thinking about. Queens raised from less than ideal stock under ideal conditions will be better than queens raised from, I, from ideal stock under less than ideal conditions. So that's nature and nurture, isn't it? So, so let that sink in. Think about that. Uh, so... In short, then, bees from faraway places never do as well in an area as, as local stock over time. So bee strains and swarming. Right. There are many swarm triggers. All bees will swarm. Stress is one trigger. Stress is one trigger. And towards the end of May in this area, the bees will be strong with supers on. And that is a time to be watchful for swarm queen cells, because that time is upon us. 
This is also the time for raising artificial sales from our selected stocks. The first two weeks in June is the time to watch in this area. And of course, it varies year on year, depending on the weather. 2019 and 2020 were both low swarming years here. I usually harvest frames of brood and nurse bees from overstrong colonies to use as for cell raisers and replace with foundation around that around this time. So uh, what do we, where are we here? So all bees will swarm, just as some take less prompting than others. So if you find less than 10 swarm cells, the strain is probably worth keeping. They've probably got a reason for wanting to swarm in that you didn't put the supers on quick enough or that they're overcrowded or some other reason. Uh, and consider making, making and taking a nucleus of that colony or making a split. Um, with that sort of colony, my father used to, and I don't do it, my, my father used to carry an empty, um, an empty honey jar with cotton oil, half filled, half filled with cotton oil, and he used to harvest those cells and use them for making up uh, spontaneous nucleuses here and there, or, you know, requeening something else. Um, if you find about 20 cells in usually a huge prolific colony with imported bees, very little honey, lots of brood, cut out all the cells and use that, that stock as a cell raiser for grass from a better, from better uh, genetics and then split that into nukes after 10 days later. Split it into nukes and give a cell 10 days later. Now then, um, I mentioned plan B earlier on. Now plan B, you come, you come to the colony and there's queen cells in it. Um, it might be the last day period of the day, the last colony, the last day period of the day, and it's half past four in the afternoon and you want to get finished. An old trick, one way of dealing with such a colony, with swarm cells, is to place the brood box chamber complete on a new stand at the far end of the apiary and replace it with an empty brood box with drawn frames or foundations and place one frame with one cell on it from the original colony with no queen in the middle of this empty box. Put it all back together and leave it. Um, share the supers if there's, if there's more than one super. And what will happen is that all the older field bees from the mother colony will fly out and they'll go back to the original stand where they find an empty brood box with just the one cell. Now those bees, those older bees, are generally speaking the ones in the colony that want to start, want that, that initiate the swarming impulse in the first place. So they'll think they've already swarmed. The bees on the new stand will now be all, they will all be young bees, so they've never flown. Um, and by the end of July, you'll have two strong colonies with young queens to take to the heather. That's an, old, that's an old trick, and it doesn't take a lot of time. It takes 10 minutes. But the end of May and beginning of June are the busiest times of the year, apart from harvest time. And the, that's, that's the hump to get over. And what happens is people are so busy, they can't, you know, they don't get around to raising their own queens. And it's a pity because that's where the gain is to be made. Uh, right. Talk about hives now. Hives, for historical reasons, too long and too boring to go into now, I've ended up with a variety of hives. Now I'm too old and silly to change now. One thing I don't believe in is having a queen in more than one box. I don't believe in double broods or brood and a half or any of that nonsense because it's not just double the work when you've got to find a queen. It's four times the work, I think, and it just wastes a lot of time. Right. Three boxes pictured here on the back of my super transporter. Um, uh, picture on the left, it's national, it's 18 and an 8 inches square, square footprint, designed by the government around 1946 after the Second War. It's got metal end spaces or plastic end spaces for the frames, so long lugs that snap off. The whole thing is too small, and altogether it's a total pain for me anyway on my bees. The ministry took the Langstroth hive, so I'm told, and copied it, implementing their own improvements. And like all government improvements, every improvement they made, made it worse. I have quite a few of these national hives. I inherited from my father, and I'm too sentimental. I use them, and I won't get rid of them. The brood box on the right is a modified dadent. It's designed by a Frenchman in America. As he designed it as an improvement on the Langstroth by having the frames two inches deeper. It is 20 inches by 18 and a half inch footprint. 
to modify data. And it is too big for me, but I have a few of these too. Uh, I tend to run them with only about nine frames instead of 11 in them. All right, so that's plenty. By the way, they use the data in time in, Fra in France because the French, uh, being French, they wanted to use the data in time. But unfortunately, they converted 20 inches as 500 mil, when actually it's 508 mil. So nothing fits uh, because they got rid of the B space. The box in the middle is my favorite and it's the one that I have most of. It takes 11 or 12 Langstroth frames depending on the spacing, and uses MD floors, roof, and supers. The MD supers are brilliant, I like them. They use the same number of frames as a national, but they contain twice the honey. This is on Dave Cushman's website. Um, I forget what it's called, but I'm told that it's a, it's a design that is used a lot in New Zealand. So that's, that's my hives. That's my thoughts on hives. All right, I spoke earlier on about lack of forage. Now, the local agriculture, as I said, is mainly dairy, but now it's on an industrial scale. They've got bigger fields, synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, few hedgerows, rye grasses without clover or any flowers whatsoever, anyway. But it's, so it's not only beekeeping that has changed in Wales over the last 50 years, and so is farming. So, as I said, Wales is a predominantly sheep dairy area, is wet and good for growing grass. In the 1960s, we were far more 20 milking cows, typical. Now it's gone up to 200 plus plus. And as I said earlier, my friend in Normandy, in northern France, he keeps several hundred colonies of these dark bees that he inherited from his grandfather. And he faces exactly the same problems as we do here, both in terms of bee imports and farming practices. So, so the, as I said, we've got floral desert in parts of Gardegenshire. But what honey we do get here is sells very well because there's no oilseed rape in it. Um, oilseed rape helps a little in England for getting the, the, the poundages up, but there's very little in Wales apart from a little down in South Pembrokeshire and maybe up somewhere like Wrexham on the borders. So the weather is changing. The weather, global warming is more extreme. There's, there's wetter, warmer, there's more, extre more extremes. Um, Varroa is here to stay. We can only control it, which is important to control it because it's, it's, it's a vector for all sorts of other problems. And I think it's a trigger for swarming. Now then, migratory beekeeping. Uh, I do a bit of migratory beekeeping and take some bees up to the heather. That's a photograph of, of bees up on the, on, on the heather last year. Uh, I made that frame up that fits on the trailer. I can get the bees, the bee I've strapped up and loaded, shut them in and strap them and load them, and I can take them out to the remote site of my own, park the trailer up, open the entrances and leave it. And then when it comes to fetching it back, when it comes to fetching it back, all I need to do is shut the entrances, hitch up, put the sides on and drive home. Uh, so it makes life easier in terms of remote humping and loading. I can collect them on my own, I can close the entrances, hitch up, drive home and get the wife to unload them. So I'll get the wife to help unload them. Right, problems. Since Varroa, yeah, it's become difficult to produce successfully mated queen. It's much more difficult now, even with the plastic cells and all the rest of the gizmos we got, it's more difficult now to produce successfully mated queens than it was in my father's day in the 1980s when he had to sit down with a saucepan and make his own queen cell cups out of wax. Um, it was more time, cons time consuming then, but it, it, was, it was more success. So this year, right, so when my father wrote his book that 80%, four out of five, he'd graft, he'd, he'd graft 30 grafts and he'd probably end up with more than 20 successfully mated queens at the end of it, or maybe 25 or something like that. So this year has been particularly difficult, and last year, for raising queens and getting them mated. Some are mated, come into lay, only to be superseded within a couple of weeks. Two have come into lay and disappeared shortly afterwards, leaving the new queenless with no cells, which is strange. And these are problems that have only appeared since for a while was here. 30% is typical today. 
There we are, disappeared, superseded. That's Roger Patterson. Have a look at um, Cushman's website. Roger Patterson has got some opinions in there and the scope for much uh, research, and I agree with him. Uh, to conclude then, sum up, the important thing is, to reiterate it again, the maximum weight of honey produced per man hour of labor input. That's the yardstick. That's the yardstick you should use. The maximum weight of honey per man over a labor input. Average year and year 50 pounds per colony per annum. Even if we give our labor free, 50 pound average year and year is just what the surplus bees need to produce year and year to cover the costs. Swarming must be controlled to achieve this. Minimum swarming. And minimum stings. I do most of my beekeeping with just a bale, smoker and hive tool. No Wellington, I don't own a pair of Wellingtons like my father. No, I own suits, I own a suit and I own gloves. There will be times when you want to make up new, nukes in the drizzle from some horrible stingy colony that you want to get rid of and you will need a suit and gloves. Uh, but I went to help a beekeeper once and when he came out he was dressed up to the hilt suited, booted, and a pair of leather gloves that wouldn't look out of place welding the Titanic. And the first thing he did was he stood on the hive stand and rocked all the hives with his foot, and then he banged the smoker against the hive front. That is what I call adversarial beekeeping. I left him to it. All right, this is something of interest. This is what I use when I wake, want to make up nukes uh, without having dodgy drones in them. I sieve them through that, and that's just an excluder uh, screwed to the bottom of, of an old brood, uh, brood chamber. Uh, that's my cloak board. I've used that every year up until this year. Uh, there's plenty of information on the web about it. It's not rocket science. Uh, it's it's just it's just a standard standard procedure. But what I have used this year, um, instead of grafting 20 cells into that. I've used what's called a Morris board that I got introduced to this year. It's on the Dave Cushman website. It's not very commonly used, but essentially what you're doing is instead of having a whole brew chamber above uh, above the cloak board, it's, it's a specialized sort of cloak board with two uh, half boxes. So then you can use you can use that and raise ten cells week on week if you want to. Um, But so, so that's that. There we are. So that's the cloak board in use. That's at the bottom box is uh, is uh, contains the queen and most of the brood. And the box above has got sealed brood only. Uh, all the nurse bees, uh, well crowded with bees. It's important to have stacks more than enough bees, and it's important to have resource plenty of pollen. And I keep some of my colonies in. Uh, uh, warm way hives, and you will find that the warm way hives will have um, uh, will have frames, good frames of, of pollen in them. Harvest some pollen from there, and make sure there's plenty of pollen, um, and the, and the feeder on top. Right, it doesn't matter if there's a flow on. Keep a feeder on there because the bees mustn't be mustn't think that they're short of resource. You you what you're doing you you uh, putting the three um, the triggers for raising queen cells, the swarming in instinct, which is they're crowded, they're getting plenty of income, the emergency because they're hopelessly queenless, uh, and the supersedure when you've taken the cloak board slider out and they can see the queen downstairs. So you, you, you're getting the best, best available um, chance for the nurturing for your queen cells. Um, and that's 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 important. That's important. I like to see with these plastic cups, these easy busy um, plastic uh, transparent plastic cups. I like to see royal jelly left in them when 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 the queen is is when it's all sealed and the queen is finished eating. Uh, it's, that's a frame of grafts from my yard. I think it is. Uh, Seventy-five percent acceptance. I think about fifteen out of twenty. And. There's a frame of graphs from Roger Patterson, which has got 10 graphs in there and 10 acceptances. So 100%. Uh, 
That's making up nukes. Sometimes you have to do that. That's splitting the colony that raise the queen cells up and uh, some other uh, resource bits and pieces, a couple of frames in each one and a couple of empty frames, uh, all homemade uh, nuke boxes. They seem to work quite well. Uh, I have tried polystyrene nuke boxes, but it's so wet here, I, the po polystyrene nuke boxes end up with slugs in them. I don't know if that's general. Anybody else have that problem? All right, this is, this is an out APA mine this year. This year, let me go back a couple of slides. All right, so let's go back to that. Um, Roger Patterson there, you going to present acceptance. So whatever method of queen rearing it is important, there are ample resources. Huge number of young bees, hopelessly queenless, at least to start with, plenty of pollen and resource, uh, i.e. a feeder on top. And I think this is, this is what Michael Palmer said again, this to remind you again, queens raised from less than ideal stock, maybe you think that your best colony isn't the best, but raise some queens from it. Because queens raised from less than ideal stock under ideal conditions would be better than queens raised from ideal stock under less than ideal conditions. So, it, so what he's saying is, it's better to have a less good, a less good uh, genetic queen raised well than a better genetic queen raised what my father used to call scrubbily. It's 27, 28, 29. Right, this is one of my year periods here on the 11th of July. Now this year has been a pretty poor year. It's been wet. July was a wet month and mid once the weather broke in June, it was downhill all the way. And my bees have been DNA tested in recent time. A guy from Bangor came down here and they took samples and they all came back stating that they're 80% plus AMM. Now this year 2020 has been a very poor one in Cardigan as I said. Yet this is one of my apiaries stocked, and these bees were taken in July, July. The hives are all modified adents, and each super typically twice the capacity of a national. Now two of these colonies are on their fourth super. Right? And so these, these bees produce an, an above average crop year on year, and they weren't fed a drop or syrup last year, and they haven't been fed a drop or syrup again this year, as they have got plenty of honey left in their large commodious brood chambers. They're efficient in terms of honey produced per man hour of labor input, and I'm happy with them. Uh, most of these are from my father's strains originally. Uh, and to quote again, Mike Palmer, the best bees for your area are already in your yard or in your neighbor's yard, breed from them. And that's, that's a remote apiary that I've got, and there's no other bees within three miles, I suppose. I got a couple of good drone colonies up there, this, uh, like skyscrapers, and I take my nukes up there to be mated. Um, all right, that's a picture of my old man taken uh, about 20 odd years ago now. Uh, and he's going to go about, he's going to set about, give me a hand to set about uh, requeening a, a vicious colony. And that's all the protection he's got. He's got special spats around his ankles because Bees are the habit of trying to nail his socks to his ankles. But uh, other than that, it's just a smock, no gloves, no drama. Uh, so information, Dave Cushman's website is well worth a look at over the winter. You will have nothing to do over the winter, do that. Better than the films on uh, BBC Old Christmas. Uh, Weber website, uh, that's a video, I know it's a total area, total different bees to our area. They have uh, they have seven months of really, really fantastic weather and they have five months of 10 foot deep in snow. But uh, uh, the the the, uh, the um, knowledge is, what he talks about there is, is all makes sense. Uh, another one from California, scientific, scientific beekeeping, Randy Oliver, uh, I've met him and listened to him and very knowledgeable and whatever he says, he can prove it scientifically. It's not something he's copied and pasted from anyone else. Uh, Willie Robson reflections on beekeeping. Willie Robson comes from an area uh, drier than here, but harsh, just the same. And he's successfully lived 
on his bees, as did his father. So uh, again, he's, he's, he's learned, the bees have taught him, and he gets results. So The Honeybees of the British Isles, that's a book I mentioned earlier. Um, well worth a read, and it should be on everybody's shelf. Uh, these people uh, in Germany um, have done research, and they're the ones that sort of will tell you that the best bees for any area is indigenous bees over there already. Right, so uh, that's a book that's on that disc you get for six pound fifty. A uh, few little gems in there. Uh, Manley's book. I've got two hives inherited from Manley that he had made out of lease land wartime packing cases that equipment that we that we borrowed this country borrowed during the war, and they're still going and they're still good. So that says something for the American timber. Oliver Field lived off his bees. Uh, Bred his own queens from his own local stock, uh, Bill Cooper. Right, all the above, right, above all were feeding all experts of their time. And they all believed in raising their own queens from the best of their own locally adapted stocks. Manley and Field both lived exclusively off the bees, and Manley gave up farming 150 acres in the 1930s before subsidized farming because he found that the bees, under colonies, bees were more profitable. And there's another book there. A practical guide written by somebody called Roger Patterson, uh, a very quiet man, and uh, learned by beekeeping by observing the bees. The bees have fought him. Uh, I think we're coming to question time now. And that's Pero. Roger's got dogs, and I got a dog. So there we are. Okay, over to you, Roger. Well, thanks very much, Peter. I think we're back together now. Um, yeah, thanks very much for that. We've got a few questions in. Um, right, the first one is, can you describe in more detail the art of smoking that we can take away and use? That sounds like another hour's lecture, but uh, uh, have a crack at it. Well, again, it's something you can only learn by doing. You crack your, you crack your, your supers. Ah, oh, there we are, that's good. You, 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 you crack it and you put a puff of smoke in there, is when you've got the hive open, when you've got the hive open, uh, you've, got a, you've got a split second between not enough smoke and, uh, and being attacked. You, you, it's, it, you can't describe it. It's like riding a bike. I, I've, it's, it's, it's a skill. You've got to see somebody in action who's skilled at it. Uh, and you, you can't read it from a book. I'm sorry. That's as much as I can tell you. But there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a window of opportunity. If you're too late with it, you get, you, it's, it'll never work. If you're too early with it, you're over smoking the bees. But there's, it's, there's a fine line. Anyways, I, well, that's all I can tell you. Um. This is really relevant to different parts of the country, but I'll um, uh, uh, I will ask it anyway. A March first inspection seems very early. Doesn't early inspection give you any benefits? I didn't say a March first inspection. I said towards the end of March, last week in March or the first week in April, there will be a fine spell. It might be, the, might be the 18th of March or it might be the 30th of March, but it will have a high pressure and it'll be nice. You'll have a nice day and no wind, and that's the time to do it. It won't be the 1st of March. St. David's Day is the 1st of March. We all wear leaks down in Wales. Um, no, it's, it's, it might be the first week in April. It might be the second week in April. It doesn't have to be March, but sometime, usually towards in this area, towards the end of March, there will be a fine spell of weather, uh, and that's the time you're going to make sure that you give a thorough, thorough inspection to all your colonies. They won't be too strong. You can catch the queens, clip them and mark them, and see if they're the same ones as last year, and do all that sort of thing. Take your time. Um, does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, next one. Do you produce comb honey? No. That's a quick answer. <laughs> Any odd, any reason why? Too fiddly. Even with the extra 
um, uh, cost? I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to do it. It's 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 too it's too fiddly, and uh, the comb honey has got to be good quality to sell. Whereas if you, if you're extracting honey, you can extract a lot, can't you? Um, no, oh, yeah. I, I've never tried it, and I've never thought of trying it, and it's it doesn't suit my style. Okay, do you use queen excluders all the time? Right. Any reason why you perhaps might not want to use a queen excluder? Give it a crack or whatever. I would. I, I always use the queen excluder because I want to keep. I want to know where the queen is. I want the queen to stay in the brood box. I don't want the queen laying out my supers. I don't. I don't believe. Uh, I, I don't believe in extracting um, combs that have had brood in them. I'm not saying you can't do it, but I don't do it. Um, right, you keep talking to using drawn comb. How do you get it? How do you obtain it? How do you get the base? Well, to it out? It, well when I put when I put uh, a I, when I got a whole box of comb to draw, super or whatever, right? Um, uh, I put every I put a drawn comb from last year. I, I sandwich them. I, uh, foundation drawn, foundation drawn, foundation drawn, and that's that's how I get my supers drawn. Uh, that way, the bees have got if they want, if they want, if there's a flow on and they want somebody to dump the honey or the nectar quickly, there's some of the combs are drawn, and then there are foundation next door to it for the for the wax builders to draw out. With the with the uh, brood combs, I I I don't always do it, but it's nice to have the uh, um, the uh, brood combs drawn over the excluder. So in, in, in a super? In a super. <laughs> yeah. use, use the brood chamber as a super to get the combs drawn because they, they draw them nicer up in the air over the excluder. It's warmer, I think. I don't know. But um, especially if you have old foundation from last year and it's, it's not quite as yellow as it's maybe gone a bit white. If you sandwich it in between drawn combs from the previous year, then you've got a better chance of, of the bees drawing it out. Right. Next question. Uh, somebody asked you, say you clip your queens, do you think this is really important? Well, I don't always get round to it, but I... You know, if you're only inspecting them for 14 days and they've tried to swarm and they're sealed cells and then those cells are open, then you know that they've tried to swarm. You've lost your queen, but you haven't lost your swarm. Um, but it's a debatable point. If I see the queen and I mark the queen, I clip it. Okay. Um have you many feral colonies locally? If so, what are they like as survivors? I don't know. I don't know. What, you mean you don't know if there are any local? I, I know of feral colonies. I know of them locally, but I'm not sure how many, how long they've been in there. Are they, are they a new swarm that went in this year? I haven't been going down early in the spring to see. Right, and that's all. Uh, there are feral colonies in chimneys and, and in walls and things like this, and people will tell you they've been there for ten years or twenty years. But when you when you look into it, they 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 died out probably every other year. Okay. Uh, do you use worker or drone foundation in the supers? I use well. I use mostly worker foundation in the supers. Because when we had zinc queen excluders, the queens used to get up there. And it wasn't such a disaster. Now I use mostly plastic excluders or wire excluders, and they're more reliable. They, they tend to, the queens don't get through them so easily. Okay. Um... Do you use black foundation to highlight the eggs? Um, this is obviously black plastic foundation. I've had I've had uh, an affair with plastic foundation. Um, 
I, when it first came out, I thought this is the answer to the maiden's prayer. It's nice and cheap. Um, I tried it, and I was and the bees made a mess of it. And I was told that they need to coat it with extra wax. I coated it with wax until it was thick as anything. And very, the bees prefer wax foundation to the plastic every time because I, I put every other one, and they've drawn all the wax out and ignored the plastic until they have to. Uh, and I won't I won't buy any more plastic frames. Well, that was short and sharp, then, wasn't it? Um, do you obtain queens uh, from elsewhere in Wales? No. No? Easy, then. Uh, do you keep records of your queens? Yes. <laughs> Any tips on storing drawn comb? Drawn out comb? Any tips on storing drawn comb? Yeah, drawn out comb. No. Well, uh, I, I sometimes, I can't get it anymore. I used to have a contact where you could get big plastic bags, right? I'm talking about wheelie bin size plastic, not wheelie bin, industrial size plastic bags. And you could stack about nine or 10 supers in it. You could, you could unwind it, put it on the floor, and put about 10 supers in it. And I used to seal the supers up in there with um, acetic acid, which kills moths and, and kills everything. Uh, but since I haven't been able to get those bags anymore, I haven't bothered. So I just stack them now and make sure they're mouse proof. And I don't get a lot of trouble <coughs> with wax moths, really. Um, interesting one here. Um, how do you feel about beehive monitoring, monitoring electronically? Who's going to pay for it? <laughs> that. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, well, it's, assume, it's, assuming you could afford it. Yeah. Uh, what's your view about it? I, I, don't, I can't imagine how any beekeeper could afford that because it would, your bees would have to produce 500 pounds of honey per colony surplus, not, not 50. But it's, it's an expensive sledgehammer to crack a nut, I think. It's uh it's if if all the equipment was free yeah and fine right go for it but um i haven't really considered it okay um do you think there's any future in not treating for varroa um now i've put this together from about three uh questions yes provided you monitor uh, right, not treating for varroa and hoping that it isn't there isn't the answer. You need to. Um, uh, there's a little product, a little French product called Varroa Easy Check, available from Thorns. It's a little cup uh, with a sieve in it, and you put 200 bees or 300 bees in it and, and drown them in alcohol uh, and give it a shake and hold it up to the light. And that, I think, is a pretty accurate way of checking what your varroa count is like. And unless you do that, you need to do that. And if they need treating, then you treat them. And if they don't need treating, then bingo. That's a complete from them. But um, you need to monitor it. Just, just not treating and hoping that the varroa has gone away isn't the answer. But do you think that we will eventually get um, resistant bees? Yes. You do, okay. Um, you mentioned Heather. Is it managed uh, in, in traditional way, I suppose? If not, is the crop reduced from what it used to be? Very much reduced, very much reduced. It, it used to burn, year about, they used to burn the Heather every four or five years on a cycle. And I think some a bureaucrat <laughs> somewhere or other has decided that we no longer burn the heather and is now it's just it's, it's all bracken and mess and weeds and it's horrible but uh, there we are that's another farming practice has changed right okay uh, somebody's asked if you can show your uh, well yeah second reference slide again that would mean going back um 
uh, and um, that will take a little bit of time. Um, last one then. Um, do you have woodpecker problems? No. No. Is that because they're not in your area, or you? There's no woodpeckers in this part of the world. I bought some hives once, and they came from Lincolnshire or somewhere, some of the over the east side of England, and every handle had woodpecker holes in them. But it's something that we don't get here. It's it's the bigger pro biggest problem here we get uh, in the winter is damp. It's wet and it's damp, and keeping it, keeping the hives dry is 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 a bigger problem and than um than pests wasp is a pest well wasps are a pest but um the woodpeckers no woodpeckers are not a problem okay um right okay then i'll just uh chuck one in myself you mentioned slugs in um, polystyrene nuke boxes you're not the only person that has them because um i certainly do as well in, in west sussex and i think a lot of other people do as well slugs absolutely love them so that's just a comment from me so uh just reminds me to uh, thank you very much um uh peter for um uh, for the last hour